fear. What are we going to lose if they say that there's genocide? On the other hand, you see, you have the Armenians. And what they're doing is they've been beating the Turks over the head endlessly. Saying, say you did it, say you did it, say you did it. And over here, the Turks, and, and one of the people who use this word says, we're, we're, we're exhausted, we're, we can't breathe. The more they feel beaten over the head, the more they, they feel it, you know, there isn't space to say genocide. So who is going to take the risk of telling and saying, perhaps a, suggesting in the Armenian community, maybe you need to lay off. <laughs> like in the long term, if you want this community to get to a point where they can acknowledge it, maybe you need to, need to lay off. Well, you know, if your identity is about having connected to having the world acknowledge that it's terrible wrong, what's the fear of, of giving that up? So one way of thinking about leadership then is, is at, that, at that very raw age, is what sort of interventions can you make that allow people to address what they feel felt is very deep sense of loss. Because it's not change that people resist. People resist being forced to change. Or what they really resist is the possibility of loss, either real or perceived. Now what's this very powerful documentary of these three Palestinian children and three Israelis? Some of you may have seen this on PBS. And uh, it was a moment where his grandmother Palestinian boy takes the grandson uh, to the old homestead, which before 1948, when you know they were uh, either left or driven out of Israel, and she gives him this key to the, the, the home. Very moving. Now, at the end, towards the end of the documentary, the director is talking to the children. He's talking to this boy. And the boy has the key. He says, I've got this key, and I'm going to my son, and he'll give it to his son. Who in the Palestinian community is going to take it on to, to, to get that boy and all he represents to go over to say, sorry, it ain't going to happen. Not going to happen. You know, the other community is totally torn. I mean, if you look at Gaza and the West Bank, you can find a community more torn apart. And the terrible irony is that they fight one another rather than address the real problem because what they're avoiding is a loss. This is a hypothesis. They don't want to do that work. They don't want to face that. Likewise, in the Israeli community, Yitzhak Rabin paid the price of trying to mobilize people in Israel to make an accommodation to Palestinians. How does he, how, how do you get people who, the settlers and who believe that the land of uh, Samaria and Judea was given to you by God? How do you get them to rethink, well, maybe you need to give that up? If you really want peace, maybe that's what you have to give up. It's, it's a very, um, Profound challenge. Now, in the absence of people with the capacity to you know, do that, what we find is uh, technical problem solving, or, or the problem just gets avoided, and, and people fight it up among themselves. In this uh, experience in, uh, with the Armenians and Turks, I heard an expression I never heard before, where one of the women, in the Armenian uh, group. She said all she ever wanted to do was to go back to Armenia and touch the ground where her grandmother had walked. Her grandmother had, was one of the few people who had escaped at nine years old. She escaped because she was um, buried underneath all the other members of her family who had been killed. Mm -hmm. They didn't see her. And so this woman talked very movingly about this grandmother and how she wanted to go back. And this was a woman who was uh, in her late 30s and talked about how she'd always wanted to be in a relationship to have, to have children. 
and she'd been in relationships with non-Armenian men. Wonderful relationships, but she, but she said, she describes, I have the sense that if I don't marry an Armenian man and have Armenian children, that I'm committing this thing, white genocide. The red genocide is the blood of those who died in 1915. White genocide is what she describes that she was playing a part. She was colluding in a sense. You know, if she didn't, you know, have Armenian children and, and, and it was apparently moving to watch because here's a woman who in her head could see the you know the, the nature of, of that the, the irrationality of that in the trap. But her heart the most had cut up with it. And so here she was like trapped wanting to realize but 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 couldn't create it. You know? uh, do you want to say anything about your experiences? I just I'm wondering in the Peace Corps. <laughs> Well, I'm sure you have some stories. I mean, that, what you're, I, I don't really know exactly what to say except for what you're saying. I think it's really interesting and powerful and the desire to hold on and, and what you're letting go of. You know, you mentioned like there's a real connection around Armenian um, sense of self, you know, a sense of being Armenian and what that means. And there's a lot of attachment to uh, the genocide and, you know, I don't know how to articulate it very well. And so it's also personal for me and being there and really feeling a sense of compassion for people. But um, but I can also see how it's a real barrier and it's limiting and it's and it's stunting the country. Yes. So I will do that in a little bit. <coughs> what um, impressed me was that uh, first arriving that on the news, almost a hundred years later, every day this issue is talked about. In the government, among the people, it's at the forefront of their minds. <coughs> that was one of the things that was very apparent here that the people were exhausted. <laughs> but they felt like they could, I mean, they, they'd say they'd go to the pubs and they're exhausted, and they, they, but they keep, like an addiction, they've got to keep the time because if they don't, if, they, if we don't keep alive, this kind of, what then? <laughs> That's what's happened when the fall of the Soviet Union and the Baltics and, um, and this whole sense of identity and um, having a structure, longing for freedom, getting the freedom, and then lose, and then no structure to fall into. And, and then going back to grabbing identity. Yes. And recreating it all over again in the, in the political structure. Yes. There's a very powerful book called uh, uh, An Evil Cradling, which is written by Brian Keenan who was a, a, a teacher, a school teacher in Belfast, in Northern Ireland, who he decided they want a break. So to get a break, he went to Beirut. No. <laughs> <laughs> he went to Beirut. He was teaching at American University. You may remember this, I forget how many years ago, there were a number of people kidnapped, a couple of Americans, and they were kept in captivity for like four years, four or five years. He writes a very, very powerful book about this experience. There's a, there's a tremendous moment in it. Tremendous is the wrong word. It's just a tremendous sense of what it, what, it, what it reflects about this identity issue. But he's been there about three and a half years, and he's grown a beard. And these guards, these uh, Muslim guards, tell him, we're going to shave the beard. Right. And the whole thing about this, he's also sharing a cell with an Englishman of Irish extraction, but he's an Englishman. And Keenan says, no. You know, it's like, this is it, the line in the sand. He says, you've taken my freedom, you've taken everything from me, not the beard. This is the and so we over here, John McCarthy, this Englishman, and he thinks, this, 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 these Irish truly are mad. <laughs> <laughs> they are, they're not crazy people. You know, you, you're going to risk your life for a bit of fluff on your chin. You know? And Keenan says, because all you have is your identity. And if you lose that, you've got nothing. So here you have a man who, in that condition, that whole sense of self becomes attached to the beard. And he's willing to risk his life for that. So, 